Welcome everyone. My name is Aaron Norton and I am an uh, adjunct instructor at the University of South Florida. For those of you watching this online, this is a lecture that I recorded for students in my counseling and community settings course in the master's degree program in rehabilitation and mental health counseling program at USF. Uh, we are a KCREP accredited program, duly accredited for rehabilitation counseling and also for clinical mental health counseling. And what we're going to be covering in this lecture is basically a, a review of all of the different therapeutic professions um, that specialize in mental health um, and what are some of the similarities and dissimilarities between these different therapeutic professions. What um, We'll also cover some of the labor market information, workforce projections, pay and benefits and some of these professions. What are the therapeutic professions that we're going to be covering? Um, they will be uh, basically clinical mental health counselors, rehabilitation counselors. Um, we'll cover clinical social workers, uh, counseling and clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, and if I didn't already say it, marriage and family therapists we will cover as well. So what is professional identity? And why are we talking about it? We're referring to the philosophy, training model, and scope of practice that characterizes a particular profession. And it's really important for counselors to have a sense of their professional identity for several reasons. One is to be very clear on what you do and what you do not do as a counselor. In other words, your scope of practice and to be able to provide an explanation to clients, prospective clients, referral sources, other healthcare practitioners, the public at large, and in some cases in terms of professional advocacy for legislators um, on what we do and what we do not do. This is also important because as you know from those of you who watched my professional associations lecture, you know that I'm a big proponent of professional advocacy, meaning that we advocate for licensed clinical mental health counselors to continue to be able to do the type of work that we do. And that includes diagnosing and treating mental disorders, administering and interpreting psychological tests, uh, and so forth. So it's very important to have a pretty solid professional identity. It also, I think, gives you a good framework um, and a good frame of reference for the work that you do, a sense of meaning and purpose, and even pride in the work that you do. So the therapeutic professionals that we are talking about when we compare and contrast some of these professions are mental health professionals who are trained to help people with problems that manifest behaviorally or psychologically and may have roots in physical, psychological, or spiritual dimensions. Um, now, traditionally, uh, there have been attempts to define specific mental health professions based on the severity of client problems. So for example, if you go back far enough, people thought of psychiatrists as the people who treat people with persistent and severe mental illness, and counselors might have been thought of as more people who work with the worried well or milder cases in terms of career and lifestyle choices. Certainly, if you go back far enough in the counseling profession, we originally were um, career and lifestyle choice counselors. And we weren't as much focused on pathology. That began to shift in the 1930s. And it began to shift all the more dramatically in the 1960s with the clinical or with the um, community mental health centers and the staffing of those centers with professional counselors. Um, to where today we certainly have clinical mental health counselors who are counselors who are specifically have specific expertise in diagnosing and treating mental disorders, including severe mental disorders. But our roots are more in career and lifestyle choice. And for more information on this, you can also look at my lecture on the history of the profession of counseling. So the different therapeutic professions that we're going to talk about today are social workers, specifically clinical social workers, or you might say mental health and substance abuse social workers. We will talk about psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners. We will talk about psychologists and more specifically counseling and clinical psychologists. And we will also talk about rehabilitation counselors, marriage and family therapists, clinical mental health counselors, and substance abuse counselors. 
So my disclaimer here is that, in my opinion, it is very unwise to enter a profession mostly because of labor market. In other words, workforce projections, trends, and pay and benefits and those sorts of things. Um, some of the work that I've done as a counselor, I've got a lot of clients who come in, especially in their midlife and that sort of thing, and say, you know, I got into a particular profession, maybe for the wrong reasons. I've worked my way up through the ranks, climbed the ladder, and now today I find myself dragging myself to work every day, um, just hating and lamenting what I have to do. I don't enjoy it at all. I don't find it meaningful or purposeful, but I feel kind of stuck because I've spent all this time in this profession. I've built myself up. I'm now sort of dependent on earning a certain income. Um, I have a lot of debt, and I don't think I can afford to start all over in a new profession and climb my way up from the bottom. So I hear those kinds of things from people all the time. I think in our field, it's great that we have a very meaningful career that has a lot of purpose in it. And some people come to our field as a second career, having already worked in another career for a while, and others don't. But we don't do the work that we do because of pay, obviously. We do it because it matches our values and our interests, because we find satisfaction, meaning, and purpose in what we do. At the same time, though, I think it would be wise and responsible for anybody to know about the job market and the pay and benefits for any profession that they're going to grad school and investing a lot of time and money studying for. So I want you to get a sense of that information from this lecture as well. And it's good to know what your income might look like so that you can have realistic expectations and you can plan accordingly. If, for example, you think that you're going to earn a much, much higher income than is realistic in our profession, you might not uh, make the same choices as a grad student. You might accrue more debt and so forth, thinking that you'll easily be able to pay it off later. Um, but I think it's important to have a realistic picture of, of pay. So we're going to start with social workers. <clears throat> um, when you read this description of social workers, a practice that consists of the professional application of social work values, principles, and techniques to one or more of the following ends, helping people obtain tangible services, counseling and psychotherapy with individuals, families, or groups, helping communities or groups provide or improvise or improve, I mean, social and health services, and participating in legislative processes. When you see this description, you see something that looks an awful lot like a lot of descriptions that people will provide for counselors. So I think that just sort of illustrates some of the overlap between our professions. The primary uh, professional association for social workers is the National Association of Social Workers, or the NASW. Um, but there are some differences between social workers and counselors. Social work is a much more broad discipline than professional counseling. There are different types of social workers. There are... Um, hospital or healthcare social workers that don't provide psychotherapy or diagnosis or evaluation. There are social workers who primarily do lobbying and community organizing or case management and those sorts of things. Um, whereas professional counselors are much more focused on the practice of counseling instead. That professional relationship between client and counselor that's aimed at helping clients to achieve goals that they have in their life. They might be health-related goals. Um, they may be providing psychotherapy for people with serious mental disorders, but um, counselors are primarily focused on counseling, whereas social workers get some training in counseling, but that's not their primary focus. They are trained to so they might have more training in administration, case management, advocacy, community organizing, and so forth that we don't emphasize as much in counseling programs. They're trained to recognize the importance of client environment, status, and roles in society. They have strong family therapy training. They help individuals, groups, and communities to enhance social functioning. At one point, the master's degree in social work was viewed as the terminal degree, but now, of course, we have doctorates in social work, or DSWs. 
And the National Association of Social Workers is essentially the equivalent of, in our counseling profession, the American Counseling Association. So social workers um, typically will only need a master's degree in order to be licensed, just like counselors. As counselors, we can have a doctorate if we want, but we only need a master's degree to be licensed in our profession. So if you look at labor market information, the U.S. Department of Labor provides several different categories for social workers, health care social workers, mental health and substance abuse social workers, other and child, family and school social workers. We will be focusing on mental health and substance abuse social workers in this lecture because this course is primarily focused on clinical mental health counseling and, and related professions. So again, if you look at this description of mental health and substance abuse social workers, you see a description that looks an awful lot like the description of clinical mental health counselors. They may provide individual and group therapy, crisis intervention, case management, client advocacy, prevention, and education. Well, so do clinical mental health counselors. Now, before we go any further and look at labor market information, I want to define the term bright outlook. This is a term that's used in U.S. Department of Labor uh, literature. You'll see it on ONET uh, online, which is a government resource, uh, a sort of catalog of occupations in the United States that was intended to replace the old U.S. Department of um, Occupational Titles, or DOT. So a career with a bright outlook has to match at least one of the following criteria. Either A, it's projected to grow much faster than average, I, um, defined by an increase, an employment increase of 15% or more over a 10-year period. And in the case of the data that we'll be looking at, even though it's 2017 now, the most current data available through the Department of Labor is 2014. So everything's going to be based on, on that year. Um, the second criterion is that a bright outlook occupation is projected to have 100,000 or more job openings over that same 10-year period. And the third is a new and emerging occupation in high growth industry. Now, what you will see is that all the therapeutic professions have a bright outlook. Um, and probably more because of the first um, bullet, the first criterion projected to grow much faster than average. There's a much faster than average growth rate projected for all of the therapeutic professions over the 10 year period going into the future. This is because the healthcare industry in general is expanding and growing in the United States and people are becoming increasingly more aware of the role of mental health treatment and behavioral health care in this country. So social workers have a faster than average growth, but job openings are not necessarily considered numerous. And I gave you some wage information here. In the year 2014, um, in Florida, the average social worker, the median income for social workers was $39,210 a year, which is a little under the national average of $42,700 a year, as you'll see right here in the middle. The red bar is Florida. The blue bar is the United States. And at first, if you're a social work student watching this, you're probably thinking to yourself, hold on a second. I'm going to get a master's in social work so that I can only make $39,000 a year if I'm lucky enough to start off with an average social work job. That really doesn't sound worth it at all. But Let's go to the next slide here and take a look at something. Look on the right side, typical education. And what you will see is that in the um, sample or in the population that the Department of Labor is reporting wage information on, only 36% of those social workers had a master's degree, or basically 38% of them had a master's or higher. Whereas 41% had a bachelor's and then an additional 22% or so had less than a bachelor's degree. So what the wage information that you see online is not comparable to the wage that a master's level 
social worker and certainly not a licensed clinical social worker would be earning we would expect. We would expect that those with a master's degree or higher and especially those who have a state license would earn more than that median income. So that's the problem that you will repeatedly see when you go online and you research wage information for these master's level therapeutic professions is that you're going to get an awful lot of noise because the the samples include people who may have social worker in their job title or something, but they're not going to be master's level and they're not going to be licensed in many cases. And this provides the illusion that we're earning less than we do. So those of you who are depressed over those wage statistics, um, think about that and hopefully that will help you to feel a little bit better about some of the stuff you're seeing online. Now in the U.S., um, as you can see, there are an awful lot of social workers. Um, 140,000 projected for the year 2024 with a 19% growth rate, 5,000 annual projected job openings. So uh, pretty in-demand occupation. Now let's move on to psychiatrists. And I forgot to tell you, by the way, here in Florida, you will know that somebody's a licensed clinical social worker because you will see LCSW behind their name. Um, and that is the title for many states, but not all states, because, as you know, licenses vary from state to state, or hopefully, as you know, anyway. Um, you'll know that somebody has a master's degree in social work because you will see an MSW behind their uh, name. And if they have a bachelor's in social worker, you may see a BSW. So psychiatrists are going to be either MDs or DOs. MDs are medical doctors. And DOs are doctors of, of osteopathy. MDs are your traditional medical school scenario where somebody goes to med school and, and they become an MD, but they also specialize in treating major psychological disorders. The big difference between MDs and DOs, they both um, can do things like prescribe medication and diagnose, and they're both, you know, physicians. But DOs are supposed to be trained on a more holistic model than MDs are. Nowadays, very few psychiatrists provide therapy or counseling anymore. Primarily, they do medication maintenance. If you refer a client to a psychiatrist on their insurance panel, they're probably going to go in and they might spend, oh, maybe 15 minutes with the psychiatrist face-to-face -face in an initial appointment before that psychiatrist is offering some recommendations for medication options and that sort of thing. So oftentimes these are, the psychiatrists are, don't have a whole lot of time to spend with clients. Now I do know private practice psychiatrists who do not accept insurance who will spend a great deal of time with a client before they will consider prescribing medications. It might be one to two to four hours that they'll actually spend with a client. And I do know psychiatrists who provide psychotherapy, but they are few and far between nowadays. They typically use the medical model um, and they're, they're mostly focused on medication, although there are some exceptions. Their primary association is the American Psychiatric Association. If you look at wage information, they make a pretty good amount. In the U.S., the median income was almost $200,000 in 2014. And um, they do have a pretty fast expected, especially in Florida, a good percentage uh, uh, of change in terms of projected job openings in the future. And unlike the master's level professions, you will see that 94% of the population that, you, that these stats relate to have a doctorate or higher. I'm surprised it's not 100%. I don't understand how 5% of their sample could have a master's or bachelor's and still call themselves a psychiatrist. But nonetheless, um, it just is what it is. But they should have a doctorate, an MD or a DO, to be a psychiatrist and to be licensed as one certainly here in Florida. So let's move on to psychiatric mental health nursing. This is a newer trend where you will see that a lot of community mental health centers, for example, may have like one or two psychiatrists on staff. But then they'll have several um, psychiatric nurse practitioners working under the psychiatrist who are doing most of the meeting with patients and prescribing medications and so forth, but they're considered supervised by the psychiatrists. 
um, you're going to see a lot. We see a lot of nurse practitioners. For example, you look at um, CVS and their minute clinics um, where they have nurse practitioners who work at those locations and you can just sort of walk in and get basic health care. Um, and those nurse practitioners are supervised by um, other mental health or I'm sorry, by um, by medical doctors. So these are nurses who have gone beyond a bachelor's and they are master's level and they assess, diagnose and treat individuals or families with psychiatric disorders. In Florida, you will see the um, initials ARMP where the acronym ARMP behind their names that's that uh, denotes advanced registered nurse practitioner and um, in Florida the ARMP is under the general supervision of a licensed physician osteopath or dentist there are three ARMP specialists here in Florida or specialties here in Florida certified registered nurse anesthetists certified nurse midwives and nurse practitioners, which is the category that you will see psychiatric nurse practitioners. Here in Florida, though, they cannot um, prescribe addictive medications. Um, essentially, they would have to recommend the addictive medication and the physician would have to sign off on it. Um, I, for those of you who are students, you will see in Canvas some additional information posted about that. So now let's move on to psychologists. I didn't give you wage information for nurse practitioners because unfortunately the Department of Labor sort of meshes the master's level nurse practitioners into the same category as lower level nurses and that makes the data too fuzzy to do much with. But if we move on to psychologists, there are essentially three different psychology degrees. They are all um, Licensed psychologists are going to be doctorate level. So you've got the PhD or the Doctor of Philosophy. That's the traditional psychology degree. It emphasizes research and testing versus clinical practice in most cases. You'll see this is a very popular uh, degree in public universities. The second is an EDD or Doctor of Education in, or Educational Psychology. It is increasingly very hard to be licensed as a clinical or counseling psychologist if you have an EDD. Um, so it's the least popular route. We also have the newer PsyD or Doctor of Psychology. The difference is the PsyD programs uh, tend to, to be more focused on clinical practice and less focused on research and um, experimentation and, and traditional academia. Now, PsyD degree programs here in Florida, for example, I'm only aware of one PsyD program in a public university. They're pretty much all going to be in private institutions, and so they're more expensive, but they're a great option for people who aren't as interested in research and are more interested in direct clinical care. So since the 40s, they've been viewed as experts in psychological assessment, although, as you'll see from some of my other lectures, counselors have been psychometricians since the very beginning of our profession in the early 1900s, um, despite uh, what some people may believe about counselors. Um, some areas of specialization, clinical, social, cognitive, developmental, counseling, industrial, and school psychology. So you can see psychology is a very broad profession focused on the study of human behavior. And there are multiple specialized areas of psychology. And what we're going to focus more on in terms of mental health professionals is counseling and clinical psychologists. Counseling psychologists are very close in terms of their professional identity to clinical mental health counselors. Very difficult to distinguish us from each other. So many psychologists provide counseling or therapy, but many do not. There are psychologists who just do research or they just do testing and evaluation and they don't do any therapy or counseling. So that's one difference you will see with some clinical psychologists and clinical mental health counselors. Um, and the APA, the American Psychological Association, is their primary association for psychologists. The Department of Labor gives you different subtypes for psychologists when you try to research labor and market information. But if we just look at clinical counseling and school psychologists, again, you have to take this information with a grain of salt because 
only half of the population that the Department of Labor provides stats for has a doctorate or higher. So this won't necessarily tell us what a licensed psychologist would earn, but the median income for psychologists in 2014 was $73,270 in the United States. And again, you will see from the projected employment section there that this is a, an in-demand occupation with good growth projected for the future. So now we'll move on to rehabilitation counselors. You might think it's kind of odd for me to include this group in with a lecture that mostly focuses on clinical mental health counseling. But um, because we are a dual major rehabilitation and mental health counseling program, I still thought it was important to provide information on rehabilitation counselors. Rehabilitation counselors are, in, are counselors who specialize in working with people with disabilities to achieve living goals and um, to maximize their independence and their economic self-sufficiency, typically with an emphasis on vocation or the world of work. They can be found in private practice in facilities, universities, schools, government agencies, and insurance companies anywhere where there are people that are working with individuals with disabilities and with a goal of returning them to work. They're primarily trained at the graduate level, but there are entry-level positions, I, I will tell you from experience, with a bachelor's degree. I used to be a rehabilitation counselor and I only had a bachelor's when I became one working for the state, even though the emphasis is to try and get people with a master's degree. Their education programs only require 48 credit hours, um, and their big credential is not a license. In most states, there is no license for rehabilitation counselor, and some there are, but there is a national certification called the CRC credential, or Certified Rehabilitation Counselor, and I have a separate lecture on certifications where I get into this more, but um, that credential it, because CR or rehabilitation counseling is mandated in every state in the U.S., including U.S. provinces, there is a government entity called RSA, the Rehabilitation Services Administration, that sort of mandates and kind of oversees the public rehabilitation counseling sector, and they prefer for rehabilitation counselors to have a master's and a CRC. This is often not the case, though. Um, rehabilitation counselors may also work as private rehabilitation counselors. That's actually a more lucrative profession um, or, or setting for rehabilitation counselors, where they may do vocational evaluation. They may be expert witnesses in court for disability-related cases, workers' comp cases, and so forth. Uh, the wages in floor, or in the U.S. in the year 2014, the median income was $34,670 a year. There also, again, um, in Florida at least anyway, they're fairly in demand. Um, but again, when you look at this wage information, keep in mind that only a little over half of the people that are being described have a graduate level degree, let alone a CRC. So you have to take all of this with a grain of salt. Moving on to marriage and family therapists. These are mental health professionals trained in psychotherapy and family systems, licensed to diagnose and treat mental and emotional disorders within the context of marriage, couples, and family systems. Recently, there was a big fight in the state of Texas where um, different groups were trying to prevent licensed marriage and family therapists there from being able to diagnose uh, mental disorders. And uh, the outcome was that it was determined that uh, marriage and family therapists can, in fact, continue to diagnose mental disorders in the state of Texas. You will see that's typically the case in most states. But they focus more on a systems approach on the family system or the, the system of the relationship than on the individuals per se. So they have more systemic training. Um, and that's really about the big difference. They're very similar to clinical mental health counselors, but with that focus on marriage and family and on systems. 
Mm, let's see. Not really anything else I want to say about them except we'll take a look at some of the stats here. The median income in 2014 in Florida was $40,230. And um, but again, you have to take this information with a grain of salt because only about 53% of them, uh, of the people from which we drew this information, had a master's degree, and we certainly don't know how many of them had a license as a marriage and family therapist. Moving on to clinical mental health counselors, our primary of focus. I gave you a definition for what we are from the American Mental Health Counseling Association, which is the largest national association that primarily advocates for clinical mental health counselors. They are a division of the American Counseling Association. They define clinical mental health counseling as a provision of professional counseling services involving the application of principles of psychotherapy, human development, learning theory, group dynamics, and the etiology of mental illness, and its functional behavior to individuals, couples, families, and groups for the purposes of A, promoting optimal mental health, B, dealing with normal problems of living, and C, treating psychopathology. So we both work with normal sort of presentations so to speak. I'm using the word normal um, to denote basically the idea that somebody does not have a diagnosable disorder, but we also have that expertise in mental disorders. So we can provide wellness-based counseling or we can provide psychotherapy, which is their counseling that's aimed at treating um, significant mental disorders. Our practice includes diagnosing and treating psychoeducation, consultation, and clinical research. All 50 states have a license for master's level or higher counselors. Our major accrediting body is KCREP, um, or, and uh, we require, for clinical mental health counseling, you have to have a minimum of 60 credit hours for school counseling, which is unrelated to clinical mental health counseling, there is a 48 credit hour minimum. Um, prof the profession of counseling itself is a pretty broad uh, profession with different specialties, but what we all have in common is our emphasis on the counseling process. Counseling is defined by the 2020 Task Force, which was a group of all the major counseling um, organizations and authorities that all got together and agreed on a on a consensus for a definition of our profession. But counseling as a broad profession is a professional relationship that empowers diverse individuals, families, and groups to accomplish mental health, wellness, education, and career goals. So basically counselors are people who provide a professional relationship to empower individuals to accomplish their goals. We may focus on adjustment, existential issues, psychological health and well-being, or achieving goals in settings like home, work, and school. We're diverse and multicultural in our practice. And um, again, when you get more specific with clinical mental health counseling, you see that added expertise of pathology, mental health disorders, DSM, that sort of thing. Um, so what separates us from other therapeutic professionals? It's really in the name. Our training and education is going to emphasize the counseling process. So we are sort of the experts in counseling, so to speak, along with counseling psychologists. Our historical roots were in the vocational guidance movement, assisting clients with career and lifestyle choices versus treating severe pathology, but our profession, profession has certainly expanded and shifted over the decades. We are now the largest sector, in fact, of the behavioral health care workforce. According to the NPI database, most licensed um, therapeutic professionals are going to be in the NPI database because you must have an NPI num number to work with any third-party payer, whether it's government or insurance or EAPs or whatever. So 37% um, of all behavioral health care professionals in the United States are counselors. Coming in at number two, we have social workers at 29%, three is psychologists at 16%, 
psychiatrists at 9%, marriage and family therapists 7%, and other at 2%. I don't know if psychiatric ner um, uh, nurse practitioners, I don't, I don't know if they're included on this chart at all. I don't think they are because I can imagine that they would only comprise 2%. I imagine that they're probably more numerous than psychiatrists nowadays, but I don't know for sure. So when we look at counselors, in Florida, the average or median income in 2014 was $42,930. But again, you really have to take a look at the population that we derive this data from because 53% of these mental health counselors do not have a master's degree or higher. That means that 47% do not. So this is not an accurate portrayal of what a master's level licensed counselor would be earning in Florida, I don't think. I think you would see something closer to looking at the bracket here, probably closer to the 90 percentile um, when you start looking at licensed master's level or between the 75th and 90th. But that's, that's just an estimation on my part. But look at these percent changes. These are huge compared to some of the other therapeutic professions. We project a 27% increase in a 10-year period in the state of Florida. So we are an in-demand, growing, expanding occupation, with, uh, which is good news for you who um, are counseling students. So looking at the U.S. Department of Labor data, we have to remember mental health counseling is a bright outlook occupation. Median pay in 2014 was 43000 but nearly half of these folks didn't have a master's degree, let alone a license. So is this wage information realistic? Well, I would argue no, it is not realistic. And so you don't have to be as pessimistic when you think about going to grad school and then spending two years as a registered intern um, before you get your license as a mental health counselor here in Florida, um, all for $43,000 a year on average. I, I would submit to you that you'll get paid more than that. What I tend to see is when you graduate with a master's in counseling, you do not get paid a lot. You're going to get paid probably in the mid to upper 30,000s a year um, to the early 40,000s. So probably somewhere between 35 and $45,000 a year will be your income as a registered mental health counselor intern. Here in, in the Tampa Bay area, I see a lot of positions that are around 40,000 a year for registered interns, so you don't get paid a lot as a registered intern when you graduate. But when you get licensed, the jobs in the Tampa Bay area range from the mid-40s to 60000 a year starting salary, whether it's bay care, behavioral health, or it's the VA system, which starts you off closer to 60000 a year, or private insurance companies are one of the higher payers that starts you off around $60,000 a year as well. Um, so that's what you're going to see as a starting salary in most agency or organization settings. Um, but you're going to see much higher wage possibilities or prospects in private practice. However, we do have another data source. The American Counseling Association conducted a major study on the state of compensation for counselors in the United States. So let's look at what they have to tell us. The data was collected in 2014. I participated in it for my students. You will see that this information is all in Canvas, the full report from the ACA. Um, but it's probably representative of compensation in 2013. The sampling by specialty, there were 5,000 mental health counselors, uh, under 600 rehabilitation counselors, 1.6 thousand school counselors, about 600 counselor educators, 1,000 other counselors. Um, there's a total of 8,949 counselors. Um, they have a varying length of experience. 86% of them were full-time. So this is something to keep in mind. I would argue that the data that you're going to see is also an underestimate of the actual wages in our profession. And the reason why, let's start off with this. 14% of them aren't even full-time. Second, 6% of them are still master's students, so they're not licensed. 72% have a master's degree, but that doesn't mean they have a license. 5% are doctoral students. Students tend to make less money than people who aren't students. 14% have a doctorate, 4% other, and 9% only have a bachelor's degree or, or not even a st student 
and don't have a master's degree. So again, I think you're going to see much lower numbers than you'll see in the real world when you're a licensed counselor. Also, when I took this survey, I want you to keep in mind that those of us who are licensed and we're working in the field, we get a lot of survey requests through email. We get tons of them. And those of us who are really busy in private practice and maybe earning a high income, we're not we can only spend so much time running a business and then and then volunteering to participate in surveys. I would submit to you that because this survey took me about 45 minutes, if I remember correctly, I think most licensed counselors in a private practice setting who are making good income took one look at this email and then put it in the trash bin. The people who are more likely to participate in the survey, I think, are going to be people who have time on their hands and are newer to the profession and don't earn as much. I think that's that's very likely. We call this in the social sciences volunteer bias. The idea that those who volunteer to participate in a survey may have substantial differences from those who do not volunteer. And in this case, I believe that the people who volunteered earn a lower income than those who did not volunteer. Nonetheless, we'll still look at it for the sake of it. Um, some of the key findings with it, benefits offered by employers to counselors are actually pretty good and much better than the average US employee. The longer you stay in this profession, the higher your earnings get. This is one profession that rewards experience. Many counselors work only part time for whatever reasons. Certain work settings will compensate very well and others will not. So the setting you work in will make a difference in terms of income. One in three counselors have more than one job. 58% work part-time in private practice or as an adjunct instructor. Um, private practitioners frequently take on all aspects of business management, including accounting. And there's tremendous variation in wages in this sample. For example, some people earn less than $10,000 a year. 13% of their sample earn less than that. I tell you right off the bat, that is so unrealistic because no job for a licensed counselor is going to start off at, thir at less than $10,000 a year. Um, you're going to see them, again, starting out in the mid-40s to $60,000 a year here in the Tampa Bay area. So it, it just tells you that you have to be very critical of the numbers that you're about to see. Here's a breakdown of the different settings that these counselors worked in. You can look at that later for, for students who have this slideshow in their module. Um, and compensation will vary regionally. Look at Alaska with higher income, um, but keep in mind, cost of living is higher in Alaska as well. And your specialty makes a different counselor educators make a higher salary, they're mostly professional or professors. I'm going to skip some of these slides and go straight to some fun facts, so to speak, on pay for the clinical mental health counselors that you saw in this sample from the ACA study. A licensed mental health counselor with a master's degree and more than 10 years of experience working for an insurance company is probably making more than $90,000 a year. So working for insurance companies is one of your higher payer settings where you're doing mostly utilization management. What you do is you obtain clinical information from counselors in the field who are requesting authorization for maybe intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization or inpatient treatment for a client. And you review to see if, if um, the counselor's done a good job of um, providing adequate information to show that the client really is in need of that level of care. A new mental health counselor with a master's working towards licensure may make up to 30000 per year. Again, I think that's an underestimate um, because here in the Tampa Bay area, for example, th all the major agencies are hiring like in the mid-30s to the upper 30s, maybe even in the 40s. I know some jobs at some of the local CMHCs that start you off at 40000 a year as a registered intern if you're doing in-home therapy. So this may make up to 30000 per year. Sounds like a dramatic underestimate to me, or a significant underestimate anyway. An LMHC with a doctoral degree and five years of experience working at a counseling agency, which is not one of the higher paying settings, may make about $52,000 a year. 
counselor educators are going to make more than others in many cases. A counselor educator is a licensed counselor who has a doc, or, or I'm sorry, a counselor educator who is a licensed counselor and has a doctorate and has at least 10 years of experience can expect to make more than $70,000 a year from this sample anyway. A counselor educator with a master's making approximately $45,000 per year. So actually professors, I don't think, make a whole lot of money. Now you may know this here in Florida. You can look up any professor's income online if they work in a public university. So for those of you who are USF students, you can see how much I make. You can see how much any other professor makes. That's not as much as some people might think. But uh, if you're like me, you know, my, my game plan is when I finish my doctorate because I'm still a doctoral student, even though I, I'm master's level and I have a license and I'm an adjunct. But when I get finish my doctorate, I'm going to try and get a position, an instructor position full time where I'm probably able to get all my work done in three days of work at the university and still have two full days in private practice where I earn a lot more than I would make teaching, to be quite honest with you. I make pretty good money in, in my private practice. So rehabilitation counselors, 38% of them were making more than 60000 a year in this sample. A CRC with a master's working at a counseling agency with at least 10 years of experience may make $66,000 a year. A new CRC with one to three years of experience working in a state or local government setting can make 40000 a year. And somebody who is not certified with one to three an uncertified CRC with one to three years of experience, I think that is working in a rehab agency may make 30,000 a year. We don't really talk about school counselors because that's not the focus of our, um, of our lecture here, but private practitioners generally in this sample worked fewer hours. They didn't really earn a lot more on paper at least. They had fewer benefits and more varied job duties but again, I can tell you, I really strongly believe that private practice counselors who earn a good income were very unlikely to participate in this survey. I know many master's level licensed counselors in private practice who are earning $100,000 a year. But in this sample, that was like less than 1% of counselors. So I really just don't think it's, it's an adequate representation. I can tell you for full self-disclosure, in the last 12 months in my private practice, I grossed prior to your expenses and everything, something like $110,000. Um, you know, then you take out your taxes and, and benefits and office rental fees and all that stuff. But um, I'm not saying this to be boastful either, but that's part time because I teach part-time and I'm a full-time doctoral student. So even not working as much as I could in my private practice, I'm pulling in more than, than what you're seeing these stats show for people. Private practitioner with 20 years of experience in this sample earned 58,000 a year on average, whereas a private practitioner with three years or less was only earning 20,000 per year in this sample. So um, I just don't think that's very realistic for people. Um, hours per week is going to be a little bit less work in private practice. For when for my students, when you see me do my private practice lecture, you'll see that I provide some research on what's different about some of the experiences of private practice counselors versus those in agency settings. Now, so let's talk about some things here. Today, here in Florida, licensed mental health counselors can do basically a lot. We have a very powerful license here. And in many states we do. We can diagnose and treat mental disorders. We can administer tests. A lot of people don't think that we can administer and interpret tests, but we can. As long as the individual licensed mental health counselor has appropriate training in, um, in administering and interpreting a psychological test, then they can do so. Um, that's a well-documented fact. And if you want more information on that, I encourage you to go to www.n bfe.net. That's N as in national, B as in board, F as in forensic, and E as in evaluators. So the National Board of Forensic Evaluators, nbfe.net. And then click on, actually I'll show you real quick here. You go to 
Uh, let's go to nbfe.net. Actually, let's do this in a new tab. And uh, let's click on, I'm probably in an admin view here, so I need to get into the public website. This is your public website from the National Board of Forensic Evaluators. I'm logged in, though, into the portal because I'm a member. Uh, actually, if you click on Resources and then Fair Access to Tests, you will see all kinds of information about counselors and testing, including this is a good read, NBFE Analysis and Position Paper on Licensed Counselors and Psychological Tests, where we basically walk you through all of the evidence that yes, counselors can administer and interpret psychological tests. You will also see various links that apply to the national level and to various states on counselors and testing, including um, a really neat one from our own board here in Florida, testing that we can administer IQ tests and personality tests and so forth, as long as we have appropriate training expertise. So lots of great resources there. Um, because I know some of you have even been told by professors that counselors can't administer or interpret tests, and that, that's simply not true. Um, as long as you have appropriate training, then you can do it. It's within the scope of your practice. So anyway, we can diagnose and treat, administer tests. We can Baker Act, which in Florida means that somebody is an imminent threat to themselves or others because of a mental disorder, and um, they can be mandated to be admitted into a psychiatric receiving facility for a minimum of 72 hours for assessment and stabilization to determine what happens next. We can get on insurance panels where we can diagnose and treat, and we can legally use the term psychotherapist here in Florida as well. That's in the state statutes. So even though we can do an awful lot in Florida and nationally for that matter, there are still some disparities between counselors and other therapeutic professionals. So for example, we cannot currently uh, bill Medicare, whereas social workers can. There's no logic to this. I think it's just that when these Medicare regs were written, counselors, there were probably many states that didn't have a license yet, and counselor, counseling wasn't as well established in terms of licensure, whereas social workers probably were. And so they were at the table when the regs were written, um, this is, I, I really believe, soon going to change because all the major associations are very focused on advocating for counselors to be able to bill Medicare. We can now work in the VA system. Legislation was passed in 2006, but it did take about seven years to write a job description and actually implement it because sometimes the wheels of government turn slow. But even though clinical mental health counselors can now practice in the VA system, we're still a little underrepresented in the behavioral health care workforce there just because we're newer to the table, but that is changing rapidly in the VA system. Some branches of the armed forces will hire social workers, nurse practitioners, and psychologists as medical officers, um, as service members to provide counseling, but not counselors. An example is the U.S. Air Force. I tried to get into the reserves as a medical officer, but they only had uh, job descriptions for social workers and psychologists. So it, it's ironic that the one profession that can't provide counseling as an Air Force service member is a counselor. It doesn't really make sense, and I think that's an area that we need to advocate for. Some government agencies will not accept diagnoses from counselors, but they will from psychologists. Um, some vocational rehabilitation programs are a great example of that. It is not true, though, in the Social Security Administration. You'll see at that NBFE website I gave you earlier that um, the Social Security Administration does accept um, diagnostic reports from counselors. Some states don't allow counselors to diagnose, or they, they make them call it a diagnostic impression. Um, and some states, from what I hear, although I'm still trying to confirm this, require a counselor to work under a psychologist or psychiatrist. I've heard rumor that was the case for Michigan. I'm still trying to verify that and have been in contact with the American Mental Health Counselors Association and I'm waiting for on a response from them. Uh, some state psychology associations are lobbying to prevent counselors from administering psychological tests. There was a fight recently in the state of Georgia on this issue. 
Some insurance companies will reimburse psychologists for psychological testing, but not for counselors. They will reimburse counselors for an initial clinical interview and for therapy, but some will not um, reimburse counselors for testing. Um, so if a client with insurance tried to you wanted to do some testing with you, then you would have to have them pay out of pocket for it. So these are some of the few disparities that still remain that I think our professional associations really are tasked with trying to bridge the gap for. As you know, KCREP is our major accrediting body, although as of right now, I think it's something like a little over half of licensed counselors in the country did not graduate from KCREP programs. You, that's rapidly changing. In the future, I think it's going to be very hard to get a license without coming from a KCREP accredited program. Here in Florida, you are required to either come from a KCREP accredited program or a program that is KCREP equivalent and has met certain coursework requirements that are very similar to KCREP. But, in, but we're going to see this changing in the future as KCREP continues to expand and become a stronger and, uh, uh, you know, authority in, in our profession and with licensure boards. Uh, so let's see if there's anything else I really want to talk about here. Um, there's six KCREP domains for counselor education programs. The first is foundations, your basics, your essentials, foundations of mental health counseling and theory and those sorts of things. The second is counseling, prevention, and intervention strategies and techniques and models and so forth. The third is diversity and advocacy, which here you will see an overlap between our profession and social work. The fourth is assessment, where you will see an overlap with psychology and social work. Research and evaluation, which certainly overlaps with psychology. And diagnosis, which overlaps with all of the above. So these are the things that counselors are trained to do. An assessment, by the way, according to KCREP, does include administering and interpreting tests, as I mentioned earlier. Some examples of direct and indirect counseling services. We provide individual counseling, crisis intervention, substance abuse counseling, family counseling, parent education programs, stress management programs, conflict mediation, lobbying, advocacy for clients, referral to appropriate agencies or more case management services, influencing public policy. So you can see a lot of overlap with social work um, with this model of direct and indirect client uh, and system services for clinical mental health counselors. So that's about it that I wanted to share with you about the counseling profession and about um, uh, clinical mental health counseling, our professional identity, wage and uh, labor market information, and what makes us similar and dissimilar with some of the other therapeutic professionals, professions. Again, uh, just to summarize here. So social workers get a little bit more training and education and systems work, lobbying, advocacy, social change, um, policy, case management than we do. But we get training in all that stuff also just we've emphasized it less. I mean, you could literally go to USF's website and compare the coursework for social worker, um, for masters in social work with the coursework for those of us in mental health counseling, and you will see the differences. Here's your MSW program, look at this. Um, social work micro practice, diversity and social justice, foundations of social work macro practice, social welfare and policy. You don't see a social welfare and policy class in the Rehabilitation and Mental Health Counseling Program at USF. But what you do see, oh, I see, I, oh, here it is. Um, what you do see that's similar is we do have a course on social and cultural foundations, but that's one course compared to a few courses that the social work program has on a similar topic. So our coursework focuses on counseling more than the social work um, program does. Meanwhile, if you were to look at the curriculum for psychologists in the PhD psychology program here at USF, you'll see more coursework focused on research and program evaluation and testing than you will with um, the rehab mental health counseling program. 
But again, look at the Rehab Mental Health Counseling Program. You do see that we have an individual evaluation and assessment course that's required and that we have a psychopathology course that's required for diagnosing and we have a um, career and lifestyle assessment that does some more psychometrics that, or testing that deals with career and lifestyle, but we also have a research course. It's just, this is stuff that psychologists do, but they expand more on and that they have more training on in their doctoral program than we do. So that's some of the differences between psychologists or specifically clinical and counseling psychologists and clinical mental health counselors. Psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners obviously do can prescribe meds and we do not prescribe meds. Um, and marriage and family therapists have an awful lot in common with clinical mental health counselors, but with an emphasis on marriage and family therapy. So that's really sort of an overview of the differences and similarities between us all. And I'm kind of one of those who's of the opinion that all of the therapeutic professions, we're all in this together, and we would do best to sort of um, not try to have turf wars with each other and allow each of us to practice within the full scope of our, our practice because there's plenty of business and there's plenty of work out there for everybody. There's lots to do, and we should be more focused on banding together and increasing awareness for mental health treatment and for behavioral health care. Um, in my uh, humble opinion, and I think most people probably agree with that, at least in my experience, that seems to be the case. Um, but a, a small faction of people probably would not. It's been a pleasure providing this information for you all. Um, check out some of the other lectures if you're interested in learning more. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Be well.